Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. Hang out with this nerd. Nerdark is Ted. Now we ask the question, is that just OP or does your GM need to up his game? <laughs> We're going to start this video by thanking our sponsor, Nord Games. Down in the description below, you can find a special link to get a 10% discount on anything from their shop there's also a promo code down there as well that you can use instead games by gamers for gamers so today we're talking about things that maybe certain dungeon masters have banned from their games or you've been in a game and the dm is like no way now this falls into different categories one is it doesn't match with my theme two is it's you know it's not a it's not a balanced concept a lot of times you'll see that from like third party publishers and stuff like that but that's not the stuff we're going to talk about because those are those are can be kind of legitimate bands in my opinion um obviously you know you guys all should be agreeing on what type of game you're playing beforehand but for the most part, if you're playing a generic Dungeons and Dragons game and you're allowing pretty much everything from Wizards of the Coast to Maker of Dungeons and Dragons and other third party companies that you as a GM have come to know and trust, then the question is, what are the things that people are banning that, you know, maybe they don't need to ban, maybe they just need to need to GM it a little bit harder. Well, we've seen, you know, quite a lot of uh, you know, traffic and talk on on these subjects over the years, and even throughout the, the different editions of D&D. And I, I think nothing has evoked as much vehemence in 5th edition as a player character race with flying. The Eric Croker specifically. <laughs> well, oh, because they were, the, they were the first ones yeah. in 5e to get it. And then later on, we, we also got the Tiefling with some variants that gave him wings as well, or right. her as the case may be. Oh man, were people outraged. I remember the first game I ran with a player playing an Eric Croker in 5th edition. Let me tell you, it didn't change anything. Um, so it just so happened, I had already come up with the idea for the adventure. You actually played in that game. Yep. I had already come up with the idea for the adventure. And it was going to happen on the lightning rail in Eberron, which is a train. There's not a lot of room to fly around inside of a train. And the other thing, too, is like part of the adventure, you guys ended up on the rooftop of of this of the lightning row. And it was the player themselves that restricted himself. He's like, I can't fly because I can't fly fast enough to keep up with the train. Yep. It, you know, so it never even came up. Well, it came up because didn't that character get thrown off? And he didn't, um, he didn't die. Yes. But he's out. He's equally as out of the game. So, like, that's that's the saving grace of, well, my character didn't die. Yeah. But he's he got whisked out of the adventure because of what's going on. And he couldn't keep up. So, when, when you look at the, the you know, the question of, you know, is this overpowered or, you know, am, am I just doing something wrong? Well, sometimes it's a combination of both. If you can't think fast enough of how to deal with something that the, the approved material is presenting, well, then you might just want to say, well, I'm not going to allow it in my game. But you could, you know, if you're aware that these things are out there and you have a player who really is strongly inclined to play it, maybe because it's role-playing, maybe because he just wants a character, he or she wants a character that can fly, well, then you need to come up with, with times where flying... Totally allows the character to shine, and other times where it's a deficit, and and that that's what you do with all characters in all situations. You you make them shine and you bring them down. That's that's part of what this whole flux is about. Uh, being a being a like in this instance a flying character at low levels is really dangerous. Like one, if you happen to get dropped and you're flying, well, you you not only are you going to get dropped to zero, but you're going to incur an automatic two death saves. When you hit the ground. Yes. You know, so so that's that's a problem. Another problem would be if someone uses a spell that can incapacitate you and you're flying. Well, now you're falling as well. And now you're going to take damage. And now you're going to take damage. As a level character, maybe you can take that, maybe you can't. So that's problematic. So certain instances where I, where I hear the biggest thing, well, that player is going to overcome my obstacles too easily, right? Well, maybe you need to think, you need to think three-dimensionally now. And it is going to be harder, and it's going to be more challenging. But at the same time, in a few levels, that flying won't matter because a bunch of the other characters will be able to do it anyway. 
So, so I don't think it's that big a deal. So you wanted to put a ravine with a lever on the other side of it, and the players are going to have to figure out how to get it, get to it. But now this character can just fly across, right? Well, you know, maybe you have to now. Now maybe you hide the mechanism, or there's a guardian on the other side. There's a guardian in the middle. Like you know, what happens if there's a flying creature or creatures that are not not but melee, but they only attack things in the air. Well, if that dude goes up there by himself, give them the give them the warning. Don't fly across the ravine. It's not it's not going to go well for you. He does it. He dies. Well, he was warned. Well, maybe you you find a way to you know have him land back on the side with the players, and they bring him back. You know they they bring him back up. But he realizes, well, I, I, I'm not going to do that again. Well, and also too, like if there's a character flying around a lot, they're going to be susceptible to something that may not occur to the other characters very often: aerial random encounters. Right? Maybe it just doesn't come up because they're not in that in that environment. But if this guy's flying around, scouting a lot. Well, then there's always a possibility just that, you know, you, something sees you flying around. You know, you get noticed. <coughs> and, th- and that opens up, you know, to a whole new avenue of, of things. But this isn't all, all about just flying. There's other things that DMs out there have, you know, kind of shaken their fist at or, you know, grumbled under their breath that, you know, I don't like that in my game. Um, you know, whether it be, you know, multi-classing because it, it breaks away from, you know, tradition or it, it makes things like certain combinations just too powerful. Well, absolutely. And here's the thing, right? Anytime you encounter one of these options and you feel like it's overpowered, it's too strong to be put in the game at this level, whatever the case may be. Why wouldn't the adversaries think in these terms as well? Because if it exists in the world, not just for the players, but for you know the world as a whole, a fantastical place, things like flying is something they would have to deal with anyway. You know, other things where you're like, oh, I don't allow multiclassing because I don't think it makes sense, or you know, I think it's too strong, it's too powerful of, of an option. To me, you know, one, I don't actually agree with those people when they talk about multiclassing. I think, uh, I think, you know, straight class all the way up to 20th level is generally the most powerful option in the game. Uh, what happens is you start diversifying and build a broad base of skills, and you have a lot of options, but they aren't always the most powerful options. And, and as you said, you know, the, the bad guys can do the exact same thing. In my most recent session... I had my my bad guy use an action surge. And when he was already swinging three times around at you guys, hitting pretty hard, you guys were a little unexpected when he decides he's going to do it again. And the the same things that people, that, that players wind up doing, there is nothing to say that you can't create those same groupings for your monsters. Right. I mean, you might not want to do it all the time, but no. occasionally it spices things up because when your monster did that, we're like, oh my God, is it like when I'm hasted kind of moving faster? Or you're like, no, it's like when you action search, it kind of looks just like that. <laughs> it, you know, it's like, oh no, what other fighter abilities might he have now as well? You know, so it just adds a different dimension to the game, spices it up for the players. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, the other one is feats. Like, I've, I've seen this especially early on, like, you know, this includes we don't allow the variant human because we don't want feats, feats in our game. It's too strong. I honestly believe that feats are actually weaker than stat adjustments for the most part. There's some combinations you can do that are really strong, like Polar Master with Sentinel. But generally, there's a lot of things that make that not work. You know, if you don't move n- near your opponent, those never come into play. So spellcasters, ranged combatants, none of them are going to affect it. Some, th- some things are just immune to attacks of opportunity. So that's, you know, that's going to shut it down as well. And the other thing is, in, this, in that particular case, that player has put a lot of resources into being able to do that one thing. So sometimes he's going to do it, and he's going to do it well, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to muck with your combat. And, but that's fine, in my it, opinion. And it's going to go back to that, that thing that I said in the beginning, that, yeah, when you present the opportunity where it's going to be great, that player's going to shine, and he's going to love that story. 
And then there's times where it's just not going to do anything for him, and he's going to wish that, oh, I wish I had raised my strength or my constitution so that I could be, you know, I could hit harder or survive longer. And, okay, well, you know, he might still love that story too. But when you have a character, or when you have a player who focuses on a character and sees a, a tree or a path of this is what I want this guy to do, He's going to be more engrossed in that character than somebody who is just like, well, all right, well, I've maxed out my prime stat. You know, what's next? Like, I love, I love feats because they have the ability to make characters so, so much more varied than, you know, characters that don't. You take a, you take a human cleric of whatever religion, and okay, well, he's a, he's a cleric. Well, he's probably going to up his wisdom, you know, might up his charisma or intelligence, maybe his constitution, maybe he's, you know, a fighter based, they might up his strength, whatever have you. But if all you're doing is up in stats, he's just a cleric. Well, once you start layering on spell type feats, well, now he's, you know, much more of a caster. Oh, let's layer on fighting feats. Oh, well, he's clearly a fighting cleric. You know, oh, well, what if he's going to take ones that are all about interacting with, with the populace? Well, well, now he's a, a leader-type character. You can take them in so many more veins than the stats have the ability to, to go. Yeah, they, they add in these interesting things to your character that otherwise everyone would be the same other than, you know, hey, you can up your stats. So definitely, you know, again, you know, going back to the example of someone who spends all their, their abilities to be able to use a polearm, well, that's great. It's still, you only still have one reaction around. So it's, you get to be awesome for one extra action around. And then and, you shut down. And, and what, you might, you might, using that combination, you might thwart one guy's ability to attack this, this round, Okay, if if that one attack this round is so huge, well, then you got problems. Like you need to design the encounter a little bit better, or you know you need to be aware of what the player, what your characters have the ability to do, and and, and plan accordingly. Well, and yeah, and most monsters, even like a lowly orc, generally has a ranged weapon and a melee weapon. So they could literally just, you know, whip out their javelin or whatever and hurl it at your face. So it's not really a big deal. And again, it just it's just another way of doing it. It's another way of playing. It gives your character, the players, a little more choice in the game. You know, I, I agree. Also, even using that idea of a cleric, like how many different things you could do. What if you were to do something even way off the wall and go give him alertness, right? But instead of being that he's actually pretty naturally, instead of saying he's pretty naturally aware or has this great awareness of what's going on around him, he's divinely inspired. And that's why he can't be surprised. And that's why he gets a bonus to his initiative because he's been favored by his God. Like you could do fun things like that. Instead of, like you said, just taking a boring stat bump, which is actually generally the best thing you could do. It, it is what it is. There's lots of stuff that I'm certain out there that you guys think is overpowered and you don't want to use it in your game. So this is a great, great thing you can do. You can continue the conversation down in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Head down to the description where you can find the link and get your 10% discount off anything in the Nord Game Store. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.